meeting to order at 5.03 p.m. And we will do a roll call vote to see that we're all here. So you see, I have us in alphabetical order. Trustee Andrews. Here. Trustee Capel. Here. Trustee Clark. Here. And myself, Trustee Wilkerson is here. Okay. So um, back in February, we did pass a resolution regarding um, a land acknowledgement and we haven't uh, quite figured out how that is supposed to be utilized. But for today, we're gonna go ahead and read the full statement uh, into the record and I will read that. And then um, we will have further conversations about how we'll proceed after this meeting, whether we'll read the full statement or if it's abbreviated um, or if it will be placed on the agenda. So our land acknowledgement, the Altadena Library District acknowledges its presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded land of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. Altadena is located on the stolen homelands of the Hahamanga tribal land. The traditional territory of the Gabrielino Tongva is referred to as Tongvar, Tongvar, which includes the areas currently known as the Los Angeles County, Riverside County, West San Bernardino County, parts of Orange County, as well as the four Southern Channel Islands. Entities such as the United States government and non-native settlers have subjected the Gabrielino Tongva peoples to historic and continuing injustices, including genocide, forced displacement, and cultural and linguistic erasure. Altadena Library commits to learning, educating, and informing its staff and residents of present-day Altadena about the rich histories, vibrant communities, and culture of Gabrielino Tongva people, present and past. Okay. All right, moving on. Are there any changes to the agenda? Okay. So then can we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Thank you, Trustee Clark. A second. Thank you. And then we will go to a roll call vote. Trustee Andrews. Aye. Trustee Capel. Aye. Trustee Clark. Aye. And an aye vote for me. Thank you very much. Moving on to our next item, we have our consent calendar. Do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you very much. Then let's do a roll call vote. Trustee Andrews. Aye. Trustee Capel. Aye. Trustee Clark. Aye. All right, and an aye for myself. Thank you very much. Are there any items removed from the consent calendar that need to be discussed at this time? Nope, all righty. Shall we go on? So next we have uh, department updates and special presentations. Um, first with a 2022 Public Library Association Conference debrief. Nikki, would you like to share with us? Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, trustees and members of the public joining us tonight. Um, I'm just going to provide a really brief um, presentation about the 2022 Public Library Association Conference that I was lucky enough to attend along with our Youth and Family Services Department Head, Neeling Hamlington, our Adult Services Librarian, Margaret Hotanaka, um, Innovations Librarian Erin Kimbrell, and of course, Trustee uh, Jason Capel joined us in Portland as well. Um, just a high level uh, look at what each of us focused on at our conference. Milling uh, attended programming that focused on LGBTQ plus topics, um, collection development strategies, equity, diversity, and inclusion programming as well as activities and of course, children's programming and other things related to running the Youth and Family Services Department. She had a very long list in, um, a very detailed long list in the package. So I, feel, I encourage you to all take a look. Margaret, our adult services librarian, enjoyed the opening session with Lovey Jones, who um, unfortunately I wasn't able to make that, but I heard excellent things about the program. 
Um, she also attended programming on outreach work and services, especially related to um, senior services that we're looking at trying to expand in this next year, as well as um, empowering staff on customer service interactions, especially as it relates to maybe dealing with more difficult patrons, as well as best cataloging practices and more, especially as we're looking at um, the diversity audit and um, looking at the collection through the lens of both uh, making sure we're providing diverse, but also um, popular materials and also looking at what we're gonna do in terms of closing the libraries and what would keep accessible and not. So again, I think she attended some really good programming related to that. Uh, Innovations librarian and Erin Kimbrell enjoyed programming on creating playful and fun library spaces. Uh, how to perform effective diversity audits as he's one of the key members of the adult services staff that's performing diversity audit um, in that department. Uh, how to be digital navigators, as well as how to create innovative maker spaces and hands-on programming spaces as the person that's really gonna oversee that work as we move forward with the building renovations. Uh, I myself uh, focused on programs about staff well-being, um, I also attended one on First Amendment audits as something that we've been talking to staff about um, through the work with our emergency action and safety team, uh, as well as uh, librarians leading in times of crisis uh, and uh, many other programs. But I did wanna provide Jason a little time. I don't know if you wanna speak about your conference experience now or if we wanna wait um, for the trustee reports, up to you. I mean, I can, I can go now. I mean, my, I think I was making up for the last three and a half years of probably this is being my first submitted written report. Uh, but I think that probably reflects my enthusiasm coming out of the conference. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it goes without saying that not just myself, but everybody on this board and previous board members and staff and volunteers have put already a huge amount of work into both Measure Z and preparing for, for the building projects. And so I, you know, when I started taking a look at the agenda and the different panels that were gonna be taking place in Portland, uh, I, I knew I wanted to be there and I was pretty confident, uh, it would take a lot away from it, um, but it ended up being a lot more than I imagined. I think, you know, you, you see how many of us went and I think there was all of one panel that two of us happened upon at the same time and the rest was like everybody saw different things. So it was it was really amazing and it, you know I think the most important thing for me, besides just learning a lot of little details about different constructions in the public library sphere, is you know, what I mentioned in my report of you know we we can end up in this bubble, especially during the pandemic of just paying attention to what's going on in our worlds and um, to, I was a incredibly inspired by just some absolutely amazing work that uh, public library staff are doing all around the country, um, but also how lucky we are again to have Altadena as a community. You know, the things that are taking up most of the time of library staff around the country is none of the exciting stuff that we're dealing with, right? Um, you know, we talked a little bit about this in the last meeting, but it, it, it is, you know, a lot of what staff are dealing with in, in the rest of the country are, you know, demands to have books removed and, you know, kind of like all this old scarlet letter 1984 kind of stuff, right? And, and we're just so lucky here that we get to be focused on building projects and how can we expand program and how can we get in front of even more people and adding another mobile library, like all this really cool stuff that, you know, hopefully someday soon, um, the rest of the library world will be able to, re, you know, get back focused on that work of providing a public service too. So feel free to, you know, ask any questions or, you know, catch me some other time <laughs> offline if anybody wants any of the documents or anything. I had a question. Um, hope I'm not butting in front of anybody. First of all, Jason, to you and all the others who attended this meeting, thank you very much. It's like, you know, you all go and you bring back the news of the world, basically, that you can read to us to let us know what's happening. But I was intrigued by one thing that you said in your report, that your main motivation for attending was 
a broad range of panels focused on various issues we are tackling in our building projects. And I guess I wonder, you may have already answered this when you were talking, but were there did you were there a lot of stories about people who are physically improving libraries and are the funds starting to appear to rebuild library infrastructure across the country? I'm kind of interested in what's going on that way. Yeah, um, I mean, there's definitely a lot happening out there. Um, there was a, a project in Illinois, uh, a suburb of Chicago, kind of an hour outside of Chicago, where they had some of the same similar issues that we're dealing with. Um, they had a small, in, in their case, their small library was their kind of historical center, and they knew that they needed to dramatically increase the size of it while still finding a way of preserving that, that original core structure and the historical importance of it. And so just hearing from them, um, you know, a lot of the work that they did around really taking the time to be in front of the community, hear from the community and involve the community in the decision-making from beginning to end. Um, you know, I think I had some notes on that particular project in my report, but, you know, I think definitely took some good ideas from that. That report is where I kind of got some of the ideas about even thinking ahead because we're making, we're going to be making so many changes to the main library. You know, the idea of, you know, taking a week after it's completely done to just let the staff get to learn it, right? Like all the little things you would never think about, like, you know, where did that light switch get moved to and that kind of stuff. So that was kind of cool. Um, and then I would say, you know, similar to, you know, we started our meeting today with the land acknowledgement and I got to sit down on a panel uh, with the Calgary Public Libraries in Canada. Um, you know, and for those of you that don't know, the last few years have been kind of tense, uh, you know, interaction with the First Nations peoples um, in Canada as they have, you know, begun discovering mass graves near uh, some churches and schools that have some bad history there. And there's been some tension. And so they talked about how they used that as an opportunity when building their new library and creating a whole wing des you know, that's kind of committed to preserving the history and the culture of the local uh, First Nations people. And um, the work that went into that was really inspiring. So that kind of got me thinking too about, you know, I think you would even answer, ask the question of like, okay, so we have this land acknowledgement, now what, <laughs> right? And I think what I took away from that is if we're gonna be serious about this, it needs to be more than just a statement. And so starting to think about, since we uh, are still early on in the process with the main branch in particular, you know, we should start thinking about how we can, you know, are there some things we can do to kind of make that, that real, make that commitment real. Thank you. Trustee Clark, did you have any thoughts you wanted to share? Um, just that I, uh, Jason shared with uh, myself and the facilities committee, some of the slides from one of the sessions and it was really helpful to, to see those. So I think I'm probably gonna be hitting you up for some of the, some of the slides from the other ones as well, because um, it was it was great to see just firsthand what people are doing around inclusive design um, and thinking about ways to do programming for especially neurodiverse communities. Um, so yeah, I really I really appreciate it. Yeah, I was really excited to see such. Um... And I remember when Nikki asked if I wanted to go, I was like, I don't know. I don't think, I don't know if it would be, you know, if I would, if it would benefit me or if I would have anything to offer, but looking through some of the offerings in the conference, I'm actually a little bit jealous that I didn't go. Really, really um, exciting things, really innovative things. I was really um, impressed by the, the one that you mentioned in your report, uh, the utilizing VR programming to expand um, you know, opportunities. And I, I remember being at the, the African American History Museum in DC and doing something similar, like, you know, going through um, like the, there was a piece on the green book and things like that. So I think that that would be something really innovative to bring into the library space. So it looked like a really exciting conference and 
asked, it was also really cool to get a, a peek into like the inner workings of the library industry. So um, thank you all for that information that you brought back. Cool. All right. Um, all right, so shall we move on to department update report? Any trustees have any thoughts, reflections? questions about the reports we saw in our packet, pages 16 through 30. Okay. Um, sorry, I've got a quick question, uh, if I may. So this is sort of a general question and it was inspired by how much was going on with the curiosity connection um, in the course of in the course of this month's reports and it made me um, it made me wonder as we're looking at bringing a second vehicle online um, how do how do we imagine that impacting the sort of pace of programming is sort of what we're seeing in this month's report kind of the baseline for what we want to see every month? Is it high? Is it low? I guess I'm just trying to get a, a barometer on where that is. And I think that's probably, I think that's probably a Nikki question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually going to see if Ashley has thoughts because okay. she's the one that has to oversee all of the scheduling of, of the public services staff. There she Ashley, are you here? Oh, sorry. Yes, I'm here. Oh God. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. And Katie, if, if you wouldn't mind, I had one of my children yell <laughs> something to me, if you could repeat that. Absolutely. So I was saying that um, my question is inspired by all the programming that I saw related to the Curiosity Connection in this month's report. And as we're looking at bringing a second vehicle online, I'm curious to know if what we're seeing right now feels like a high level, a low level, the kind of baseline level we're looking at. Basically, how, how are we doing in terms of level of activity and what do we what do we expect to see when we get that second vehicle? Um, I feel that we've been attending a lot of outreach um, yeah. lately and um, not every time have we gone out have we seen large crowds, but there are times when we've gone out and we've connected with over 200 people. So it kind of varies. Um, I think we're still now trying to identify times again when, when it's the best times to be out or be at certain locations. But I have seen it vary. And, I, and when people do interact with us, they're happy to see us. They want what we have. They love getting a, a free book or the little owls. So like they know us and they are happy to see us when they see us out. That's amazing. Um, I'm wondering also if um, as we're tracking sort of statistics around circulation and, you know, all of that, if there's some way to quantify some of the curiosity connection outreach. I mean, I know we've got a number of programs, right, and program attendance, but I guess um, what I'm getting at is sort of type categories, maybe types of types of programs in the sense that like, being at something that somebody else's event versus hosting a library event. I don't know. I'm fascinated by all this. I think it's amazing. I love our like third branch. So yeah, definitely, definitely interested in, in seeing more data as you guys go along. Yeah, we can definitely prepare something um, and kind of break down the data that we currently have and categorize that in a way. I mean, most of what we've been doing right now, we've been getting a lot of invites Mm. Um, two places more so like schools and um, the farmers markets and things like that. So it's been more of the invite and in, as opposed to like something we plan to do. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Amazing. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a similar comment, I guess. And I, I finally found the picture here of that I wasn't aware of, I should have been the calendarized version of the curiosity collection and how it or a connection and how it stops at the Altadena Ale House. I did not know that. And uh, other business establishments, Cafe de Leche and so on. So I see it now on the schedule 
really getting around a lot more, I guess, than I realized. And I, I'm, you know, you answered a lot of my my other questions about this, the curiosity connection with your your, uh, your conversation there with Katie. But it sounds like a, a really valuable addition to the community and a bit of a, a road celebrity. It looks like right now. Is that correct? Yes, you are correct. Um, we just got another invite just last week um, for another school. They've been coming in slowly but surely. Even places we haven't been before um, have requested the van out. So getting popular again. Great, thank you, good work. I have one additional follow-up, I'm so sorry. Is there a way for people to get a library card right there on the spot? Yes, that's so which cool. I okay. love. Yes, that's awesome. <laughs> yes, we take a laptop and the hotspot out there. So um, we also bring the um, paper applications as well, and people can get a card right there on the spot. We also bring books for them to check out. So not only do they get the card, but they can check they can out check right away out. as well. Man, that's mm -hmm. so cool. Is yes. Yeah, I would uh, echo those things as well. I've, I've seen them quite a few times at the farmer's market um, and have, you know, snagged a free book even for, you know, my son. So it's, it's always um, great to see them out there. Um, and Ashley, I wanted to say I, my favorite part of your report is always the picture of the curated boxes, <laughs> which I, you know, I, every time I see it, I'm like, oh, yeah, we do that which is really cool to see, you know, um, those boxes, especially for those who are not able to get up and out um, into the community. And um, I had another shout out for Finn um, who create curated, I would say, um, a friend of mine visited the library and I went to her house to pick up her daughter for something and saw a stack of books and was like, whoa, you, you know, I see you've been to the library. And she, you know, shared that Finn had, just selected some really great things for her. So thank you for that. Thank you. All right, shall we move forward? Any other thoughts or questions? Okay, so we are moving to uh, item six, uh, the reports. And we start with our support groups in Altadena Library Foundation. Hello. Hi, Hi Good Bridget. to see you all. Um, I, want, I just want to say every time you discuss Curiosity Connection, my heart grows three sizes larger. <laughs> <laughs> the foundation has found this to be like the centerpiece of what donors really want to help support. And it's always cool to hear how excited people in the community get about it. Alrighty, I did want to start my report tonight just by reminding people of what our mission is, because I think sometimes it, people get confused and wonder what we do. So I think it's important to reiterate it from time to time for the public. And our mission is to bring people and ideas and resources together to support the needs of the library. So whatever those needs are, that it changes from month to month and year to year. But um, the foundation exists to engage with people in Altadena in order to meet those needs. So uh, we, be, we just meet every other month and not every month. So um, this past month has just been more planning, um, which we tend to do a lot of. Um, but two of our directors this year participated in National Library Week, and it happened to be two of our directors who are retired from education. Uh, they've either been teachers and or principals, administrators, and they thoroughly enjoyed reading stories to the little young'uns who showed up. Uh, we also met with the Pasadena Community Foundation to talk a little more, get a better understanding of how our endowment for the Altadena Library District will work going forward, and also how, how we can um, 
let the community know that we have this endowment and then how do we promote it and educate? So we're working on plans for that. And then we're also planning our um, annual donor appreciation or our gratitude gathering for June 12th. And we're going to have that indoors in the library this year. Um, we're also, of course, knee deep and already planning for Taste of Dina. Um, and this year we got a really lovely response from several people in the community who want to serve on the committee. So that really helps when all the weight of planning it isn't on just a couple of the directors. Um, we did do movie night, which was so much fun. These little buggers showed up in their pajamas and their grandparents came with them. And they were so, the thing that was so rewarding to me too was how many of them came up ready to purchase popcorn and sparkling water and snacks. And it was so nice to say, no, this is just for you to take. And needless to say, the hit of the night from my perspective was really the teen volunteers. I can't tell you what a difference they made. Like we never had to pop one bit of the popcorn. Martin, uh, whose last name has escaped me, he was excited and engaged and popped all the popcorn all night long. And then the other kids helped set up the games. They registered, they welcomed people as they came in. They helped with the friends booth. I mean, they came there to work and they did. They didn't just sit around and look pretty, although they look pretty, but <laughs> they really worked and we were so happy to have that. Um, and just in, in conclusion, we're, we're hoping to get maybe one or two more board members, but we're particularly looking for a director who has some financial or investment background um, so that we can begin to look a little more broadly at, at what we do with the dollars that we do invest. And that's essentially it for me tonight. Just a reminder to save the date, June 12th for our um, gratitude gathering and Saturday, September 24th for Taste of Dina. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Bridget. Sure. Does anyone have any questions for Bridget? Well, you're doing a great job, Bridget. That's my, not my Thank question, you. but my comment. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Sally with the Friends of the Altadena Library. Good evening. Hi, everybody. My connection is terrible this evening. <laughs> right? Um, everybody's freezing and uh, being segmented, and I really haven't been able to hear very much what's been going on, so I really have to check it out afterwards. So, um, but it's lovely to see you all. And um, I'll just head straight in. This month, the Friends in the Foundation, as Bridget has already told you, with the National Library Week, where we had some of our board members read to the pre-kindergarten um, and kindergarten age kids at both the main library and at Bob Lucas. And, it was delightful to say the least. It was just gorgeous. Um, the guys from the Friends out from our group were Diane Moore and Jeanette Allen. They had a lovely time and it was a really lovely thing to be involved in. Um, and our other participation this month was to introduce a second Saturday band, Las Chicas, who were amazing. And uh, to tout the upcoming activities at the library and and I guess all of you know after hearing me speak that I do have these pauses and can't remember a word and I so I introduced the band I got off the stage and Jonathan said to me were you nervous <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I speak all the time <laughs> so perhaps I'm not the best person to be introducing but it was really fun it was great and um, and then movie night, which was fantastic. The, as Bridget said, 
the volunteers were amazing. They took it on themselves to make a little sign at the friend's booth and they made, they sold books and it, uh, it, was, it was a really lovely night and everybody had huge fun. And uh, uh, coming up April the 30th is a big day uh, for us um, on 10.30 in the morning we will have the online passing of the laureates, passing of the poet laureates. And it's it's a program that we've been behind since it started the Poetry and Cookies. And so we were really pleased to be involved in that. Hope you all come. Um, and in the afternoon, Kenny, the wonderful Kenny, who um, will be painting in the plain air, as it's called. And uh, I hope you all drop a, on in for that because I think it's going to be lovely. And so I think I've covered it all. Yes, I have. And I'll, uh, I'll look forward to hearing this better in the recording or um, looking at the packet. Thanks for your time. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Sally. All right. Any questions or, or thoughts for Sally? Yeah. Did you have any questions? Did anyone have any questions? I'm so sorry. <laughs> no? Okay. All good. righty. Thank All you. Right. Okay. See ya. See ya. All right. Nikki, director's report. You're up. Hey. All right, thank you. Good to see you all again. Uh, happy April. Um, I want to start out by saying how completely excited I am to introduce Catalina Quintero as our new administrative assistant. Um, as all of you know from working with Diego, she has very big shoes to fill. Um, but here's Here's Catalina. I can't believe her first day was only two weeks ago. I bombarded her on her first day. I had to like draw this big chart on my board of like the board and the board committees and everything that her and I are working on constantly. And she just completely hit the ground running. So Catalina, I don't know if you want to say a few words. Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. So I am Catalina Quintero. Um, I am very pleased to be here. Um, when I got the call from Nikki for this position. I have not been so excited about a job in a couple of years. Um, so I hope to be of service to everybody here, to the board, to the library. Um, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. And she's being very modest, 10 plus years of experience doing administrative work. She also worked for a public library for six years. Coincidentally, um, her previous supervisor is a Facebook friend of mine. And when I spoke to her, she said, oh my gosh, I would hire her again in a heartbeat. She's amazing. So she came highly recommended and is gonna start her library degree uh, this fall. So yeah, I think it's like wonderful that she loves libraries and is very experienced in the administrative uh, work. So we're very lucky to have her and super happy to introduce you to all of you. Thank Welcome, you. Welcome Catalina. Thank you, everyone. Um, in terms of hiring, uh, I am happy to announce. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was going to chime in with a comment, but I was waiting. Sure. Go right ahead. Just clear. And Catalina, it's nice uh, meeting you virtually here. Um, my comment is that every time a job like yours gets filled at the library, one that has administrative consequences and so on, it feels like as a, as a board member, I've got a little bit more breathing room. And I think the rest of the board probably agrees with this. So, you're filling uh, a piece of the, the puzzle for us that is really important for us as uh, trustees. I just want you to know that. And thanks so much for your attention already to detail. And I'm sure we're going to keep you busy. And I'm sure you're going to like this job by the time the dust settles. So welcome aboard. Thank you. All right. Absolutely. And it was interesting because when her and I met her second week, which was last week already, um, she was telling me like, I, I did, I was doing all this research on special districts and what it means to be a special district and how that um, can impact building agendas. And in addition to all the work that she's already done on researching uh, the Brown Act, 
So again, I know we're in very good hands and the board get, will get to know you as well as I do because <laughs> we interact a lot. All right, so moving on, uh, we did have a uh, vacancy at the Bob Lucas branch for library assistant. As you know, Michelle Hoskins, who worked for us for 42 years, retired back in February. I'm very happy to announce that we have promoted our part-time clerk. Her name's Danielle Galvan Gomez to be our full-time library assistant at the Bob Lucas branch. Um, she'll be starting with us on May the 2nd. Yeah, it's really great to be able to internally promote and I know she's gonna do a fantastic job working over on that side of town for us. Um, other than that, we're in pretty good shape. That does mean we're doing a library clerk recruitment right now. Um, we're looking at not only filling that position, but also um, creating another part-time position for youth and family services. So our teen librarian, Isabel Briggs, is building some experience with this recruitment and being involved in the hiring process. So that worked out well. And I think they could really use somebody that just like focuses on desk work um, so that the other staff can focus more on programming and things like that. So it was a good opportunity to be able to hire for both departments. Uh, so the special tax mailer, I've been working with our CFD administration from NBS to finalize that, that letter. It's, um, from what my last time I spoke to her, it's going out either today or tomorrow, which is a bit of a delay, but we wanted to make sure all of that information was correct. So all property owners in Altadena will receive that letter, including those that own property, but rent that maybe don't live in the property in Altadena, just to make them aware of the special tax, um, as well as uh, information about how to file for the low income tax exemption. If you run into anyone that has questions, please send them my way or refer them to the website. Our um, altadenalibrary.org slash next dash chapter has a link to the special tax lien that also has the low income exemption form on the page, as well as both libraries, we have printed copies. That form has to be submitted by June 30th to either us or NBS. There's a mailing address on there for them. But again, if anybody has questions, please send them my way. I'm happy to answer their questions and work with them. Um, so we did celebrate National Library Week in the first week of April. I did wanna give big thanks to Ashley Watts for coordinating with the Friends and Foundation who talked to you about their experience reading to kids at both uh, the Bob Lucas Library as well as Maine. It was really great to involve them in that process. I also wanna thank, I didn't include it in my report, our staff recognition team, which is led by our Youth and Family Services Librarian Yvette Casillas for recognizing staff on National Library Worker Day, which was Tuesday of that week with lots of treats and lots of kudos and recognition throughout the week. We're very lucky to have such a great staff recognition team. Um, in terms of statistics, I was really happy to see such a dramatic increase in March to our physical library checkouts. We're gonna hope to continue to see that number rise. Um, the other number that stood out to me is, I also wanted to thank our passport services staff, Tony and Natalie, for their tireless work scheduling and conducting passport appointments. To say they are busy is nothing but an understatement. They received over a thousand phone calls in March alone. And when Ashley and I were talking to Tony about like volume and how fast we get back, they always return calls if they don't, if they're not able to take the call at the time within 24 hours. So like, exceptional customer service and really like we're, we're very lucky to have such great passport staff. Um, so as all of you are probably aware, it is National Volunteer Recognition Month. So I just wanted to again say thank you to our literacy volunteers that uh, do the one-on-one -on -one tutoring for our adult literacy program over at the Bob Lucas Library. Um, I also want to publicly thank our wonderful support groups, both uh, the Friends of the Altadena Libraries and our Altadena Library Foundation for their tireless advocacy and the resources that we need to be able to put on all of these amazing programs and purchase things like mobile library units. So thank you to them. And of course, a huge big thank you to our wonderful Board of Trustees, all of you, for the amazing amount of time and talent that you give us. Um, I know we ask a lot of this board and I just want to publicly thank you guys for everything that you do to keep things moving forward um, in such a tireless, energetic and knowledgeable way. Like I know there's somebody on this board that I can reach out to that is going to be able to answer any question that comes about. So thank you very much for 
uh, being such advocates for us as well. And then of course, next week we're gonna be, um, or this week we'll be thanking our army of fantastic teen volunteers as Bridget alluded to. They're the reason why a lot of these big events and book sales and things can happen because they show up early or late to be able to help us set up and break down and all of that. So thank you to all the teen volunteers. They're really great if you come to an event, spend some time talking to them. Ah, so thank you to all of our volunteers. Uh, as um, Sally mentioned, we're also going to be having our annual Poetry and Cookies virtual event this coming Saturday at 1030 a.m. It'll be exciting to watch the laurels being passed to our next two poets laureate. So please visit the website to register. There's a link on our programming page. And if you haven't been to the Mount Low Chamber Series, um, I would highly recommend it. They're going to be at the main library parking lot this coming Sunday from three to five. This time they're gonna be featuring their wind quintet. And I'm telling you like these local musicians will blow your mind. So if you haven't been able to attend, I highly recommend it. Definitely will be the highlight of your weekend for sure. Um, and of course, second Saturday, we still have two more to go. Um, thank you to Jason. He's going to be introducing the Jazz Zone for us on Saturday, May the 14th. Um, and also thanks to Terry for introducing in March and Sally also introduced for us in April. I really appreciate you guys welcoming everyone and introducing the band. Um, and the only other thing I have written down is that I'm very happy to report that we sold our house in Las Vegas and closed on it. So my husband and son are going to be moving here in the end of May. So I will not have to be commuting um, for the first time in over five years. So very excited to share that news. Congratulations, that's great. Thank you, I'm so excited. Um, and I did just wanna say, sorry, we left the page numbers off the board package. Well, we already added that to our checklist of things not to forget. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a beast, this thing, you know. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Um, I have one, and I've got a question that's more of a comment, but you alluded to the uh, matrix of statistics that, and slowly but surely, uh, the blanks are starting to get filled in. You know, there's better yeah, and better really. comparison, and there's catch up, and so on. And I, like you, was very happy to see what I interpreted to be the biggest uh, physical collections checkout of the, of the last 18 months happened in March, uh, over almost 18,000. Items. So, you know, some of the, this is be, be very helpful just tracking the sort of lifeblood of our library and, mm -hmm. and the work you put into this is starting to really look good. Agreed. And I've, I've been in conversation with both um, Ashley, our assistant director, and David, our IT and tech services manager, to really um, continue to analyze the collections too, to make sure that what we're purchasing is really what people are wanting to check out. Of course, we want to have a diverse and robust collection, but also make sure that we're keeping things on the shelf that um, people want to check out. And a lot of times that's high demand items. We might have to look at purchasing a little bit more of the things that are first coming out. Because we had a conversation about like, how long are you willing to wait for a new item? So it might be that we have to like look at how we spend a little bit. So constantly looking at that number too, to, I would like to see it grow quite a bit, to be honest. Other questions or notes for Nikki? No, everybody already sees me too much, I think. So. Well, I have a few. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> not, not a few. Um, I just wanted to note, um, just personally having had to call passport services uh, multiple times in the last er, two weeks. Um, I just wanted to echo what you said in terms of like both times I called, um, it wasn't 24 hours. It was like within an hour, they called me back. Um, and then just speaking with, um, them and exchanging emails about, you know, when to renew my son's passport or my, if, you know, if I can fly with him with it as it is, they were really, really helpful. And so I just wanted to, you know, send some appreciation to them for that as well. And then I had a quick question to want two other things that I missed. And I think Diana's report in terms of compost and gardening. So I was curious about 
um, I was looking at the pictures in that huge, it looks like a beet or a turnip. And when I was at the library the other day, I saw someone out there like picking food. And so I'm wondering who eats the food? Like, where does it go when folks, um, you know, all this yummy food that you're growing, who eats it? I think the best one to speak to that since Diane is not here is Jonathan. Um, okay. Both him as well as his wife who volunteers for us a lot um, are very active in the gardens. Just curious. Mm -hmm. So we, we've been seeing, there's patrons that have been coming by and been taking the food out there, uh, both here and at uh, Bob Lugas. And there's, uh, when we do have events, people are coming by and just taking the food. And there, I've seen uh, people that just come to look at the garden and uh, they've looked at it and they, they were, and they saw me out there. They said, well, is it available for us to take it? I said, yes, go, go for it. That's what it's here for, here to be a benefit for the community. And they were so excited and people are still taking it. And, and I understand that there's going to be another program coming shortly that uh, Isabel will be doing with some teens and that's going to be a benefit too in the future. Cool. Very nice. That's awesome. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to say is I was looking at this page. I don't know if you could see it with our pictures on it. And I just had a comment on that. And I just wanted to say uh, thank you for putting my picture up in the library, <laughs> not being vain at all. But um, I just want to share with you the impact that it's had on people who have come to the library. One of my friends texted me you know, saying that she cried when she saw it because we don't see a lot of us is what she said in the, you know, in these spaces. And every single person, you know, my neighbors, they said, you know, I saw you in the library. Even my son, when we were in the library, he saw it and he was thrilled to see it. So I just wanted to, you know, say thank you for, you know, putting us up on the wall because it, um, provides an opportunity for just for it to matter and representation and all that good stuff. So thank you. Oh, happy to do it. And it's a lovely picture. Too. It really is. It is a lovely picture. <laughs> yep. Photos by Waltz. Right? <laughs> you did a great job. All right. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Nikki. Oh, go ahead, Terry. Did you want to say something? No, I was going to say that's like the most inspirational thing I've heard on today on this call. Oh. So. It's really nice to know that little things like that have an effect. Yes. Like that. Yes. That's great to know. Absolutely. I'm getting lots of text messages, which is also awesome because that like lots of people are visiting the library. So mm -hmm. I'm really always happy to get a text from someone. And even just I saw someone that I didn't know, and they're like, I think I saw you in the library. And I'm like, Yeah, you probably <laughs> did. That was me. <laughs> so it was really cool. Such a local celebrity now. I, love I it. know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank Nikki. you. Mm -hmm. All right. Financial reports. Hello, Anna. Hi. How are you? Hi, everyone. Um, so just diving right in, uh, we're reviewing February 2022 financials. Um, if you're following along with your electronic copy, uh, we're, we'll be leading with page 41. Um, we're at 67% of the budget year. And on page 41, we report uh, column B, line six, we're reporting gross revenue at $3,847,605. Um, moving right along to page 42, uh, line uh, B65, column B, line 65. We're showing a total year-to-date uh, expenditures at $2,539,864. And um, with that results in a total net income uh, reflected on column B, line 66 of $1,307,000. Uh, $307,741. Um, moving along to uh, page 46, line nine, we're reflecting cash and investments at $3,256,663. Uh, total cash with the county um, is reflected on page seven, uh, 46, at uh, 2951 
Um, the total amount required to satisfy the district policy is six months. Uh, 50% operating expenses is one million nine hundred forty-one dollars eight hundred. Sorry, one million nine hundred forty-one thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars. Um, total assets are at six million eight hundred seventy-five thousand five hundred and two dollars. Um, and in terms of revenue highlights, if we hop over to page 41 of the electronic copy, um, we're closing in February at 99% of target revenues. That's 1% higher of January. Uh, line two property taxes uh, took in $3,092. Most of these year-to-date funds were received in December. Line three fines and fees contributed $4,556 primarily coming from uh, passport services. This is two times higher than the passport fees collected in January. So we saw a nice increase there. Um, for general fund expenses, uh, let's move on to line 20 of page 41. We see CalPERS retirement contribution expense is a little high in February. This is due to a timing difference. January's last payroll uh, contribution cleared our bank account in February. Um, and so this will level out because January reported a low figure of $5,600. So in terms of year to date, we'll see that this will level out. Uh, line 37 for audit and financial consulting, we saw a 10% decrease from January. And as a reminder, we should see this figure decrease in April, 2022 when we review those financials. Line 57 on page 42, uh, for library materials, we're at 70% of projected spending. We anticipate exhausting the budgeted costs of materials by the end of the fiscal year. On page 44, uh, for capital fund expenses, we spent $16,532, all related to building projects. This, include pay this includes payments to Rockland Partners for $14,055 for project management services. We paid Chicago Title uh, for preliminary title reports for both branches, totaling $2,000. We also paid for accounting support to Ike Bailey for $477, uh, specifically related to uh, the capital fund expenses. Uh, that wraps up our summary for February. I'm happy to answer any questions or comments. I, I have a quick question. I'm not at all expecting Anna to have necessarily an update on this, but <laughs> um, I know it one uh, we've talked in the past, Nikki, about um, I think I don't know if it was a consultant or somebody we were talking with about some creative solutions to the the pension liability. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if there's any updates on that because we hadn't talked about it for the last couple of meetings. I think. Yeah, we hired Cal Muni. I think you guys voted on that in. February. I'd have to look back, but we've been working, Anna and I, as well as Ian, our accountant, on writing the unfunded accrued liability policy. Mm. That's going to be taken to the budget committee on May 5th and then to the full board at your May meeting. Um, so once the policy is in place, then we'll look at how we build that into the budget, you know, in terms of like, are we going to try to designate a certain percentage of reserves if we end up in the positive that goes towards that? Are we going to try to set up a trust? like similar to what we have with the, for the OPEB spending that can build interest upon itself to pay that down. Um, but first it's getting the policy written. So you'll see that next month. Very cool. Thank yeah. you. Uh -huh. um, if I may. So just a, two real quick questions for me. Well, one question, one comment. So my comment is um, just Congratulations to all the departments on like really smart budgeting. It's rare to see our, ex like it's always, I shouldn't say rare. It's exciting to see our expenses at basically exactly where we expect them to be at this point in the year. So I feel really good about our budgeting process. It makes me feel good about what we're going into next year as well. Um, my question was on uh, revenue. This is on page 41, revenue um, line three fines and fees. I know this is mostly passport services. Do we still charge fines for anything? Do we have any revenue that comes from fines at this point? The only thing that's a fine is if somebody loses an item and they have to pay for okay. it. So there's okay. no late fees, but if you don't right. earn an item, that's where, and 
trust me, it's very little of what yeah. we take in. Okay. I was yeah. just curious. Yeah. Cause I remember we had gotten, we did away with late fees a long time ago. So late fees and we got okay. rid of collection fees too. Those were another yeah, yeah, yeah. to generate. So yeah, but it's very okay. little that we, we had taken. Is it, is it fair to understand? Um, I know it's not exactly, but is it fair to understand the vast majority of revenue in line three as passport services revenue then? Or is that not so. accurate? I, I think that's okay. fair. Would you say so too, Anna? Yes, the majority of those funds are related to passport fees. Okay, great. That's that's all I needed to know. Thanks. Uh, just a comment from me, if I may, and that is, uh, Anna, this is, I, I like your report a lot, and just a little, little things jump out at me. One of them is included on the on the uh, summary of where it talks about revenue highlights in closing February were 99% of target revenues. Oh, I'm sorry, it's in general fund and expenses. Um, 920 for CalPERS retirement contribution is a little high in February due to a timing difference. So little things like that uh, being picked up and reported are, I find them very helpful to me. So uh, we're entering into a phase that I keep preaching this to everybody where our money will easily get mixed up between what we're getting from property taxes and what we're getting from uh, from Measure Z. And so for, for you to pay that much attention to the little details like that is very comforting. I hope you keep that up and there's no explanation too uh, stupid for me anyway. <laughs> so to throw in there and let us know what's going on. So good job and I really appreciate that, that attention to detail. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions or discussion for Anna? All right, thank you so much, Anna. And then we can move on to our Board of Trustees Standing Committee reports with the Budget Committee. No, re was there a report? No report for the Budget Committee? There, right? No, there's no report this month. Right. And the CFD Committee, there was no report. Yeah, that, there's that's no report. That's correct. Uh, okay. Just a reminder to everybody that we are going to adopt a quarterly schedule for the meeting. We'll, we'll still, it'll still continue to be a standing committee and we'll meet still on the second Wednesday of every of the scheduled month at 3 p.m. The next meeting will be in June and then in one in September and one in December. Okay, thank you, Terry. Um, next is the Board of Trustees the Ad Hoc Committee reports, and it looks like we have a report from Jennifer Pearson for the Ad Hoc Facilities Committee. Yeah, this is Jason. I can just summarize. Um, Jennifer's from our, our Rackland Partners team, and so she's been luckily, lucky for me, <laughs> taking care of those, those monthly reports. Um, so I'll just kind of hit on a few things. Um, we you know, the main library, as far as any kind of design community outreach work is on hold uh, while we await, um, you know, word on the grant that we've applied for, you know, it is a very significant amount of money. And so, it, you know, it wouldn't make sense to move forward until we have some sense of what's, what's going to happen with that. Um, but in the meantime, we are progressing with all of the kind of foundational things that need to happen, you know, the various surveys and, you know, all part of kind of, you know, crossing your T's and dotting your I's um, so you don't end up with any surprises, <laughs> uh, you know, when you've already spent money. Um, we, uh, at the May board meeting, uh, we will have some additional um, details and information for the board uh, regarding both an updated timeline for both projects, as well as a revised um, kind of draft budget for, for the Bob Lucas branch. So. Uh, we have that to look forward to at the May uh, May meeting. Are there any specific questions or anything that I know it's like been kind of you had all this build up and this excitement and all this stuff happening and now it's kind of quieted down. So um, we also want to just create some space if uh, anybody, any of the board members had any questions, anything they were curious about. Okay. 
I just had a comment <laughs> as usual. No, uh, no, go, go Terry. The uh, that it was a big surprise to see a, a big uh, what seven figure grant uh, being worked on with a team that that you know seems like it's got good focus and so on. So I'm impressed. I mean, that's terrific, and I hope that it comes to something. But the whole idea that we're looking for and going after grants like that is is comforting. So thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I would just a couple of things about that. I think one, it, it was almost like tailor made for us. Um, it, it's really focused on infrastructure work that, that libraries need to tackle. Right, so that you know, whatever amount of money that we get from that grant will be used specifically for the infrastructure side of the work that needs to be done, especially at Main Branch, which is a huge chunk of the money. That would then free up the bond money that we have to do other projects, things that you know maybe they were on the kind of nice to haves list. We'd be able to move into the we can actually do this list if we get the money. So. Um, yeah, but kudos to our our, our staff because they got that grant written and in in a pretty short notice. I think less than a week. So really great work. Thank also, you, if I may say, um, thank you to Jennifer Pearson who helped with with that grant writing as well. Yeah, yeah. I think we continue to be very very happy with with the support and the work with our both. Our, our team at Racklin as well as ABA. Excellent, thank you, Jason. All right, redistricting committee. There is no report. We have a meeting schedule on the calendar for, for next month. So we'll have something for you then, hopefully. And moving on to liaison reports, we have a report here by uh, tr uh, Trustee Andrews. Yeah, this is really sort of an informational report, but I, I thought it was interesting to present to all of us. It has to do with the LA County to sort of kick off for the budget for next year and the way it works and what they're asking for and so on. I thought it was really interesting. and. Uh, it, 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 to, you know, just looking at it for a minute would be, I, I think, a, a good thing for all of us to do. The budget that was proposed at the beginning of the week, whenever that was, on the 19th of April, was one that is proposed by the CEO of the of LA County. And then that gets kicked around with uh, the supervisors and committees and such. It starts on May 11th to get public hearings and so on. And finally, they get this massage down to a number they'd like to proceed with beginning at about in June. And then there's a reconciliation that happens after that. And then a final budget that finally gets sort of officially pro proposed in its entirety a few months into the actual fiscal year, which runs from July 1st to June the 30th. But uh, if you do get a chance, it's really interesting to click on that a second page link that I have there about the actual budget itself and look at the pages and so on if you haven't done this already about what they're asking for and how they present what they're asking for and so on. It's really fascinating. And if you compare our library, which is, you know, like the Titanic in a rowboat, I guess, to the LA County Library, you get a sense of how, in, a, in some ways, our missions overlap and some of the things that are really concerning to us are concerning to them as well. On, on each uh, department that has a, a budget, you know, page or, or a budget that they're shooting for in LA County, there's going to be a, a format that's used that actually has the org chart, the organizational chart for the entire department as well. And everything is so well thought out. So it's, I mean, I'm not suggesting that we adopt exactly what they do because I don't think we need to, but it is nice to know that uh, there's so much thought put into this and so much work for consensus that's put into it after it actually, you know, hits the front page, you know, on early in the, in the process. So it's, just uh, informational, but I thought you might enjoy reading a little bit about how it works. And if you really want a nice paperweight, you can go down to 500 West Temple and pick up a hard copy of that proposed budget. My wife has two of them. <laughs> it's like the old Sears catalog or something, huh? It still is like some kind of rule or law that when they present it at that board meeting, they have to have a certain number of copies available for the public. And oh my, so God. my wife works 
at the Hall of Admin, she went and grabbed herself a copy. <laughs> so you want to do a deep dive, have at it. <laughs> Just so it can all get changed in a month anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much, Trustee Andrews. Are there any questions for regarding the, the other report? All right. And then Trustee Capel, you already gave us your uh, report earlier on. Is there anything that you wanted to add or change? Okay. Not unless anybody thought of any other questions, but nothing on my end. Okie dokie. All right. So then we have uh, no unfinished business on the calendar, so we can move into new business. Um, item A, which is to review and approve to offer a contract for copier services. David? Yes, thank you, Camila. Um, hello, trustees and members of the public. Um, we're on page 54 of your agenda packet. And as you can see there, we have an authorization request to enter a contract for copier services with a new vendor. Um, at our last board meeting, we were authorized to uh, bid for copier services. Uh, that bid closed March 31st, 5 p.m. Um, received six total bids, uh, ABM, Canon, CVE, which is our previous copier services vendor, uh, Konica, Pacific Office Automation and Xerox. Um, so we had put together a, a copier services rating team, uh, four individuals, um, myself, our um, innovations librarian, Aaron, Nikki, and Anna. Um, and the largest factors that we were considering for uh, scoring were price, the, um, how inclusive and transparent the pricing in general was, um, and then the local presence and ability to deliver within the contract uh, deadline of June 1st. And um, so based off of all the ratings, uh, the rating team unanimously chose um, Xerox as the, is the choice. Um, and if you look at the scores below, you can see, you know, the scores that are associated with uh, overall totals there. Um, and we would like to move forward with purchasing and that's our recommendation, the equipment. and. Um, we would see approximately 30% savings over the course of the contract, which is a five-year contract. And, um, you know, our, that, as I just mentioned, our recommendation is to purchase for uh, Xerox copier services. Um, all the, the costs for uh, the contract are included, that service, maintenance, um, any consumables other than paper. Um, we also built in a quarterly maintenance, preventative maintenance in, in there. So pretty much everything is included in that cost. And that's why we found it to be so transparent. And I am ready to answer any questions that may come up. Can I ask a quick question? Thanks. Um, so thank you so much for this, David, and the, the team that put everything together. I love it. Love a scoring matrix. All this looks great. I was uh, curious about one thing that you mentioned in your report, which was, you know, basically this is assuming that there's a five year viable lifespan for the equipment, um, but that if it goes longer than five years, you know, it's basically an additional savings. Do you have any sense of how how likely that is? I mean, do these things kind of catch on fire in year five or, like, I, you know, what is the what is the expectation that you have for the actual usable life of the equipment yeah i mean usually we're when we're talking copier services generally when you purchase copier services outright or copier devices outright your expected timeline is that is at a minimum of five years um so you know obviously technology does advance forward but um depending on what we're looking for for cost savings we're already saving ourselves 30 percent if we'd like to continue to extend contract, we can negotiate um, maybe like a three-year deal. So we're not entering a five-year mm -hmm. contract with them moving forward. Mm -hmm. I could see it being very likely beyond the five-year period that we'd be you know, entering into at, at least an additional three years out of the devices. And then moving forward, we can reassess. But that's, that's my initial thought. Um, Definitely the potential to get an additional five years, but you know it, it's really dependent on on many factors there. But but that's that those are my feelings overall. Super reasonable, yeah. That's great. Thank you. I had a quick question too. Um, 
Thanks. First of all, thanks for everybody for doing the, the matrix and really scrubbing up all the candidates and stuff. I was glad that we got a good pool of candidates to look at as well. So that's terrific. Um, it said that MRC will install the equipment. And one thing um, that I wondered if you talked to them about is the idea that there would be, I would presume there'd be some movement of this equipment during construction. And are they willing to come back and help you reinstall it if it's complicated or make sure the electrical sources are getting where they need to be? Did you talk to them about that? Yes, we did. Um, so they are willing to to help with any relocation of the equipment. And in fact, most often uh, companies like this request that they assist with it just because things can get jumbled. You don't want a toner all over the place. Uh, you know, so yeah, they, they'd be willing to help with any portion of that. We also asked if we were storing equipment. They, they said that there's a potential to renegotiate the, the terms for that piece of equipment, maybe servicing it beyond the, the total uh, five-year term if we have to store it for whatever reason because of these renovations. But in general, um, they can assist with the moving of the equipment. Okay. And then a follow-up question too regarding the equipment, the sort of residual value it might have at the end of five years. I, I, I think I saw one part of the proposal where they talked about trading in or you know, taking equipment on trade. And I assume that to be that like you're done with that group of equipment or that set of equipment at five years, you want to give it back to them. It's got some value then to them when you turn it in, right? That you might Correct. use the down payment against the next wave of, of uh, copiers coming through. Is that have to, kind of like a used car, I guess, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. And that that residual value is sort of to be determined about what the market will bear or things like that at the time. Okay, got it. And I do exactly. see I think our sort of performance penalties on the equipment too, where it has to operate at a certain amount of uptime. Otherwise, we're eligible for some rebates on the cost and so on. Is that how that part works? Yes. And then if we go beyond the the amount of what they call impressions or pages printed out, um, there are additional costs, but that's um, included and baked into every contract that you enter with, including the current one that we have as a lease program with CBE. So when they give us these uh, amounts and totals, these are operating on the expected amount of uh, pages printed um, uh, across all devices, essentially. Great. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments, concerns for David? Okay, then I believe this is an actionable item. So we need to move to, a, do we have a motion for the district director to authorize in contract with Xerox for copier services and purchasing of the copier equipment? So moved. I'll second. Okay, great. Then we will go to a roll call vote. Trustee Andrews. Aye. Trustee Capel. Aye. Trustee Clark. Aye. And I vote for me. Great. Awesome. Okay. Moving on to item B, review and approve to invest the bond proceeds with LAIF. Mickey. All right, good evening again. So this was actually something that we took to the Community Facilities District Committee um, back at their meeting on March 11th. Um, our municipal advisor, Doug Anderson, provided uh, the committee with a couple of options for investing the bond proceeds while it's sitting in the trust bank. Um, as you could see in the report, basically it came down to two different options, one of which was through the US Treasury. That did, does yield a higher interest rate, but unfortunately isn't necessarily gonna work for us because they want a very specific drawdown schedule with amounts and dates. Whereas if we were to invest with LAFE, um, the interest rate's not quite as high, but if, we're, if we provide like a an overview of what we anticipate with the bond with the bond proceeds and the drawdowns. We can draw, I believe you said up to every 30 days, um, depending on whatever amount it is that you need to pull. Um, currently, if we leave them where they are, they're earning less than 0.1%. So the recommendation to the board and 
Terry can speak to this as um, the chair of the CFD committee as well, is that um, we authorized me to work with our municipal advisor, Doug Anderson, to um, invest the bond proceeds with LAFE uh, with the earning rate anticipated to be 0.3%, which would generate um, almost $70,000 over a 12 month period. As you know, we're not gonna be drawing down the proceeds with probably in the next 12 months substantially. So again, happy to answer any other questions. The report is pretty detailed, so. I can jump in with a couple of factoids too, maybe just to complete your presentation. The local agency investment fund has been around for a while. It's got its own website and so on. And if you look at it, there's about 1,400 special districts that park their money there. It's you know, billions of dollars. And in fact, special districts, districts make up about 60% of their depositors. So it's a solid fund and it's, it's well managed. And even though it's three tenths of a percent, uh, it's better than one tenth. And uh, I trust it a lot more. And also the, the scheduling flexibility is something that we really need as well. Can I ask a quick question? So um, all that makes a lot of sense. Is there any reason that we have to put all the bond proceeds all in one place? Like I, I was looking at the math, I was doing my calculator math just now. And if we, even if we did like a third in the US treasury fund, like if, if we figure that we've got a drawdown schedule and we've got two thirds of it in life making, you know, whatever it's making, and a third sitting over in treasury is is there any ability to do that because it's it's a i mean it's a huge difference in the amount of interest um is that an option um i don't know to be yeah, honest the answer for me is i don't know either yeah okay. i have to get in touch with doug to find out um i have to believe it's not because uh, i would think that he would have presented that as an option but it's definitely something we can look into So maybe that um, we could either table this till next month or um, change the motion, depending on what I find out. The, the CFD committee is meeting again in June. So we could ask Doug to bring back other options at that point as well. I just, I, I hate to, I mean, I, I agree that we need the flexibility on the cash flow side. You know, like there's no question about that, but we don't necessarily need flexibility on the entire project fund. We need flexibility on some proportion of it. And so I'm wondering if there's a way to just park that money there for even 12 months. Um, you know, we're looking at something, even just a third of it, it would be something like $200,000 in interest, which is wild. Mm -hmm. I'm actually, over a 12 month period. I'm actually texting him right now. So, okay. Um, I don't know if we can uh, come back to this one. Well, I feel like I would really want to know the answer to that before voting on the disposition. So maybe, maybe uh, if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to move to table this uh, well, and bring it back. Not to cut you off there, Katie, but I'm oh, yeah. the um, the uh, report from the last meeting from that meeting, and I do see here that it appears that there is an option to do that. So we probably should get a hold of them and. Uh, yeah. Not sure. Okay. Then I move to table this item until our May meeting. Okay. Sounds good. good I'll make, and I'll make sure Doug's there. Uh, he didn't think he would need to be here tonight. So. Okay. okay. Is there a second on Katie's motion to table this into the May meeting? I'll second. Okay. All right. Then. Do we need to vote on that or do we? Okay, yeah. got it. All right, roll call vote. Trustee Andrews? Aye. Trustee Capel? Aye. Trustee Clark? Aye. And that will be an aye for me as well. All right, thank you. All right, so the next item is um, the review and approval of the indefinite suspension of the ALD COVID-19 vaccination policy regarding weekly testing procedure. Nikki? All right. Um, so as you are all aware, um, we passed a policy back um, in September of 2021 
uh, regarding vaccination and it, for employees of the district that were not fully vaccinated to be tested on a weekly basis. Um, with the recent uh, rate drop in rates, as well as um, basically the with the Omicron variant coming on and showing that whether vaccinated or not, people can spread COVID pretty easily. Um, we were, I'm all over the place, sorry. We started testing all staff at the beginning of 2022 um, with our in partnership with Avison School of Leaders. They took a two week um, spring break. So we were unable to back uh, test staff during that time. And at that point we had pulled staff to see if they thought that we should still continue to test. The majority of staff felt that we did not. Um, but then looking at the policy, we do have um, a small number of staff that are still not vaccinated. So I reached out to the SCLC director's email list to find out if other local agencies are still testing staff on a weekly basis that are not vaccinated. And of all the people that answered me, none of their organizations continue to. So um, being that I don't wanna be in violation of the policy that we passed, I'm asking that we, I'm not, I don't wanna get rid of the policy because who knows what the future holds, but that we indefinitely suspend it right now to not uh, weekly test unvaccinated staff. And again, based on the fact that most organizations around us are not as well. Happy to answer any questions. Um, this is a kind of procedural question, I guess. So are we saying we just want to suspend section four of the policy and not any of the other pieces? Is that correct? or you want to suspend the policy as a whole? I, I say the policy as a whole, because really the, the policy itself is encouraging vaccination, but ultimately that if you're not vaccinated that you will have to be tested. So. So do we have any kind of, how, do, how does that relate to like new hires, for example? Is there a vaccination requirement for people who are coming on board as new employees or how does that work? Well, we currently don't require it. It's just if we were to hire staff that are not vaccinated, they under this provision would have to get tested weekly. But again, like, um, I it's hard. I'm, I don't want to say too much if that's fair <laughs> in terms of like as we've done hiring and what people's statuses are so oh, no 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 i'm yeah i'm not interested in that at all i guess I, it's more of a procedural question of like you know kind of where we were 18 months ago is we had zero covid policy around vaccination at all and now we've got this in place mm -hmm. and i don't it doesn't feel like it makes sense to go back to no policy whatsoever um but i agree with you that if if weekly testing feels like an undue burden, then it makes sense to suspend that piece of it. Um, I guess what I would like to see is a revised COVID policy rather than trying to kind of piecemeal suspend that. This feels like it was a response to a particular moment in time, right? And I think we had specific public health conditions we were dealing with at that moment. Um, and so I wonder if it doesn't make more sense to come up with a policy that feels like it speaks to where conditions are now that that maybe is more flexible right that allows some kind of response to conditions changing because i you know i i think that they will probably continue to change um and it's difficult to predict exactly what we'll need yeah i i don't disagree um i just wonder like well how does that look in terms of other viruses or other conditions. I think we might have to take a step back and look at this in a more holistic way than specific to COVID, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because if, if our policy is around COVID vaccination, well, then does that extend itself to flu vaccination and other things like that? I think like we may want to take a look at this because I mean, we're reaching a point honestly where 
the very few number of staff that are not vaccinated, whether or not we're testing them doesn't change the fact that other staff could be positive and spreading. Right. So, you know, that's where it's like, I don't want to be in violation of this policy by not testing. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, no, like, totally. I'm happy to like approach a different, but I mean, I don't, I honestly don't know what that looks like either. Yeah. I could do some research around what other, like Jason, I don't know. Have you seen how people are moving? I mean, I'm, I know the healthcare world, mm -hmm. right? Um, right. And I mean, what I can tell you in my world is you can't convince anybody in my world that things have gotten better. Right. And so it's a much different thing. I mean, we, you know, it's, it's become a pandemic of the, of the unvaccinated that's who's in the hospitals and combining that with the fact that this, you know, we had a severe shortage of healthcare workers before this, and it's just getting progressively worse because people are getting burnt out. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, my world is a, a very different viewpoint. I guess what I was going to ask about is, um, especially in light of the silly court case, where are we at on masking policies? Because I think that kind of goes in line with Katie's point of the whole policy versus just the testing point of it. Yeah, I mean, it's we've been complying with um, the orders coming out of LA County. So when LA County lifted the masking requirement, our COVID prevention plan was updated to reflect that. So we do still have to update our COVID prevention plan. That's an internal document for staff that they have to adhere to all of those guidelines based on really what LA County, because LA County is the strictest based on if you look at the state or CDC or whatever. So we've always adhered to those. Um, so I don't know if this internal process and procedure document, I know that covers us in terms of what we're required to keep updated and provide to staff based on when these changes happen. And I work with our HR certified consultant with paychecks to make sure that we're still, you know, we're in compliance with everything that we're supposed to be doing. So I don't know if it's a procedural thing or a policy thing, you know, that's something else that we could talk about. I don't know. I mean, I think, I think we could make a decision tonight as a board just to suspend the mandatory testing and then just revisit this, mm -hmm. yeah. right? I do, I do agree that, and I think this is something that everybody's gonna struggle with is how do you create a broader policy? And it's tough, right? Cause this is like right. a respiratory based thing. Like who knows what the next one, like next one might not even be a respiratory. Right. Illness, right, mm -hmm. so I don't know. Yeah. I think, I think that's right. I think it makes sense to suspend section four of this policy um, which does mitigate that that testing piece and takes that burden off. I think that's reasonable, but I, I would also request that we see some sort of updated policy. And I, I think it's tough, right? I don't know what other public agencies are doing. I don't know what even like LA County libraries are doing in terms of their vaccination policies, but I feel like if we could we could come back to this one in, in May, um, you know, or, or when we're able to have a, a, a sense of what that might look like. I think it would make sense to rewrite this in a way that feels use, useful for us going forward rather than just burdensome because that doesn't, doesn't accomplish anything. Yeah. Yeah, I just think about like the, the larger implications in terms of other illnesses, you know, so I don't know if that can somehow incorporate itself into how we approach because again, I think about like, let's say we're going to in the spring or the fall hit flu season. Like, are we all of a sudden like requiring different things? Be I don't know. It well, I think that there's a huge difference, right? There's a huge difference in the public health impact of flu season versus even where we are now in terms of the public health impact of COVID, um, both in terms of mortality and the, you know, possibility for long-term chronic conditions. Um, so I, I, I don't know that those are, that those are necessarily comparable. Um, but I understand your point that it doesn't feel like maybe it's, that this policy doesn't feel like it's meeting the moment we're in. And I, I would mm -hmm. agree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Trustee Andrews, anything to add or? Well, I just think that um, the only thought that I have is that time changes everything. It seems like every week there's going to be some new pronouncement or something going on with this. So and it, it feels to me as if it's a little early to start messing too much with this until we know we get a little bit better guidance with this, the evolution of time. Uh, it's, eventually, the, the virus is going to get to a steady state that people can live with. And I don't, I'm just not sure we're there yet as a society. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I also would agree with all of that. I think it makes more sense to just put that section of it to suspend that section um, versus the whole policy because we still are in a pandemic and we don't know, you know, what, like you said, things could shift tomorrow morning um, and we just don't know. And so I think that if anything, to your point, Nikki, in terms of like how we look at other um, health issues, I think there could possibly be more of a guidelines or, you know, procedures around just being healthy, you know, just wash your hands, you know, just in terms of um, how to prevent the spread of, you know, of germs and, and other uh, illnesses and diseases. But this, I feel, is a little bit more severe, which I would want to, you know, kind of continue to reflect on because it is still, we are still in the state of a pandemic. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not uh, trying to downplay the severity. I just yeah. think about it from an enforcement standpoint, I guess. Yeah. You know? Like I have to think about how policies carry out. Right, and if you write it, you uniformly. have to enforce it. Yeah, so. Yeah. Well, and I, I guess if I may, I just do have one kind of question from the from the other side of things, which is like, you're absolutely right that we're seeing more breakthrough cases and that it's, you know, it's no longer just, are you vaccinated or not? But does it make sense in light of that to abandon testing altogether, right? If it is the case that more people, you know, this is a more transmissible variant, um, is it is it reasonable to just say, well, we're not gonna test anybody then and kind of hope it all works out? I mean, I do, I think that there's an argument to be made that testing everybody on a weekly basis is in some ways more informative um, in the current state of things. I don't think probably anybody wants to, but I'm just, I'm, you know. Well, and my understanding is there is funds are running out in terms of free testing. So if you have staff that are not covered by insurance, um, we'd have to figure out that too. Because mm -hmm. like up until now, anyone that doesn't have insurance, um, it was being paid for. But from mm -hmm. what I understand that that funding has run out. So we'd have to figure out what the implications would be, and largely with um, part-time staff, obviously. Uh, I think if anything, I'm, I would be more comfortable of just a suspension of that section because if something changes tomorrow, there's a new variant or numbers start to get out of control again you you we would have to then talk about all right so then maybe we should start testing everyone again mm -hmm. and so it, it just makes sense to push pause on that piece of it um versus uh you know all of the the testing you know getting rid of the testing piece and you know undoing the work and the for lack of a better word, drama, this policy brought. Uh, that would be my thought. Okay. Then I'm going to make a motion that we suspend the testing requirement in, as set forth in section four of the policy. I have a second. Okay. This has been 
Motioned and seconded. So then we can do a roll call vote to uh, suspend section four of the ALD COVID uh, policy. Sorry, I just point of or I do want to only suspend, suspend the testing portion okay. of section four because there's section four covers okay. testing and face masks. Um, oh, and got it. So I think we just want to do the testing portion. Okay. All right, so then we will take a roll call vote on suspending the testing portion of section four of the COVID policy, the ALD COVID policy. So could I just ask real quick what that, how that would read in section four? Would do we just strike that language or do we rewrite the, I'm sorry to be nitpicky. I think, no, 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 I think it's a good question. I think it would be something like, um, you know, as of um, whatever, April 25th, 2022, and then strike through the first half of that. Uh, so all employees and then strike through who are not fully vaccinated, uh, um, ending at tested weekly for COVID-19. I think, I mean, we do still have to be compliant with whatever the masking requirements are set forth by LA County. So in some sense that supersedes any policy that we have anyway. Um, so does it pick up with must wear a face mask covering those? Well, masks? I don't want to suspend that part, right? Like, I think that, I think it's important actually. Um, so, so I guess that's what I'm saying. You would only strike that small portion and then it would, it would pick up and must wear or must wear a face mask mm -hmm. and then lose the rest of that um you know COVID 19 testing failure to comply employees will not be allowed to return like the rest of that section yeah make it a much shorter section mm -hmm. yeah all right i'm done with is my it, question is it can i ask a question yeah I'm not out of order <laughs> is it possible to add you know basically you know as of like you were stating as of the date such and such and such that you know this portion or exactly writing into it what is being suspended at like adding to the policy yeah why don't we just i'm going to withdraw my motion we should amend this policy right. and make it say what we want it to say rather than suspending something if we're not going to suspend it wholesale so um uh let me just try um let me see how you guys feel about this. Um, okay, so um, what if we take section four and relabel it. Um, sorry, I'm doing this live. Okay, so if we take section four and imagine it doesn't exist and there's a new section four that says section four compliance with LA County guidelines that reads as of April 25th, 2022, all employees must comply with public health regulations as set forth by LA County officials with regard to masking in indoor spaces, period. And that's the new section four. Mm -hmm. okay. Does that feel better? I feel like that's the cleaner for sure than suspending kind of in a very unclear way. Well, plus it's got mentioned about what the county's doing too. So. Right, which I feel like is is probably just as well because that's that allows us to move ebb and flow with the county, which is what we've been doing, you know, consistently all along. So, does everybody feel okay with that language? Right. Okay. <laughs> okay, then I'm gonna. I so I withdrew my original motion, mm -hmm. throw it away, um, make a new motion uh, that we amend the COVID nineteen policy. Uh, as I just described, and I am going to put that language in the chat because I'm not going to read it all back. Um, and that we replace the existing section four with that new section four around compliance with LA County guidelines. Do you have a second? Yeah, I second that. Okay. All right. So 
this amended motion has been moved and seconded and the, <laughs> the motion on the floor is to amend the COVID, the ALD COVID-19 policy um, with new language as set forth in the chat um, as of April 25th. All right, uh, so Trustee Andrews. Aye. Trustee Capel. Aye. Trustee Clark. Aye. Okay, and that will be an I vote for me as well. Thank you. And it's, um, so you will send that because it won't stay in the chat, right? Someone will have to copy it out to modify the policy. Yeah, I'll yes, we can yeah. copy that. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, great. Perfect, all right. Okay, so then we can move on to the next item, request for Partial closure on May 17th for staff training. Yeah. Nikki. Uh, thank you again. Um, so library administration is seeking approval for a partial closer, closure of both the main library and Bob Lucas on Tuesday, May 17th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at both sites. Uh, as you know, we've been working with North Star Consulting on board development, as well as uh, management team leadership alignment, and our next, what we're calling the next chapter of staff development with Jennifer Coyle. Um, we want to bring all of the staff together to do the next round of training. Uh, what that would look like is we'll bring staff in at 9 a.m., hold training at the main library till 1, then allow uh, a lunch break from 1 to 2, and then open the library um, at 2 o'clock. Thankfully, Tuesday is a, it's an evening that we're open. So main library would be open from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. and Bob would be open from two to six. Um, so happy to answer any questions and would love to offer some more training to staff. Are there any questions for Nikki? You post this all well in advance so people know, right? Oh yeah, yeah, as soon as uh, we, if we get approval tonight, we'll make sure to start uh, updating the calendars appropriately. I thought it was funny that the fiscal impact was like, people are gonna make fewer copies, <laughs> like in light yeah, of our copy. I, I saw that from a- the, I thought that was funny. When you guys um, closed for strategic planning. Yeah, I mean, it's true. It's just like, okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah, we're um, gonna close $2 a lot. You know. <laughs> All right, um, move to approve the closure on uh, May 17th, uh, set forth. Mm -hmm. Second, anyone? A second. Okay. All right, so we will take a roll call vote. Trustee Andrews? Aye. Trustee Capel? Aye. Trustee Clark? Aye. And an I vote for me as well, okay. All right, so last item of new business is the review and approval of resolution 2022-6 to extend the provisions of resolution 2021-05, um, authorizing remote teleconference meetings of the legislative bodies of the Altadena Library District for the period of May 1st through May 31st. Do we have a motion? Or can someone motion? So um, we extend the resolution. Okay, so Terry I got have it. Both of you. All right, I'll, Terry. I'll second. Okay. All right. Let's take a roll call vote. Trustee Andrews. Aye. Trustee Capel. Aye. Trustee Clark. Aye. And an I vote for me. Thank you. All righty. So lastly, I think that we are needing to now move into a closed session, right? So are there any items to add or revise of the closed session agenda items? All right. May we have a motion to adapt the closed session agenda items? So moved. Mm -hmm. Second. All right. Can we do a roll call vote? Um, Trustee Andrews? Aye. Trustee Capel? Aye. Trustee Clark? 
Aye. And I vote for me as well. And then is there any public comment on the closed, the agenda items for the closed session? Okay. I think I forgot to ask for um, comments earlier. Yeah, too, Catalina, we haven't received any public comment. Is that correct? We have not, no. Thank you. Okay, so then may I have a motion to convene and uh, to move into the closed session? So moved. All right, second. Okay, thank you. Let's do a roll call vote. Trustee Andrews. I think he's frozen. Terry? Are you frozen, Terry? Oh, no, you're here. <laughs> we're, we're gonna do a vote to move into the closed session. Aye. Okay. Trustee Capel. Aye. Trustee Clark. Aye. All right. And then as I vote for me as well. So we are going to leave for a closed session. This um, meeting will be open um, and we will return to rejoin you at the close of the closed session. All right. We'll see you in the other Zoom room, okay? Okay. I have emailed you guys the link. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
Okay. <clears throat> we are all back and reconvened in our open session at 7.48 p.m. and ready to move on to our next agenda item. There was no actions that are needed to be reported on from the closed session. So let us go to our next item, number 12, which is governance. There's no um, nothing that needs to happen in terms of governance right now, right? All right, moving on to announcements and planning, correspondence, and proposed future agenda items, which I believe that we had some suggestions. Is that right, Katie? Yeah, so in addition to the items that obviously came up earlier in the meeting, so a couple of things that we're bringing back next month, um, just a request to have an update on um, elections and outreach and what we as a district can do to encourage people to run um, for our November elections that are coming up uh, for the board this year. So a request to have some some info and some thoughts and some ways that we can help um, for our main meeting. Okay. All right. I think that that is, looks like all of our agendas our, uh, items for today. Thank you very much. So may I have a motion for us to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. Second, okay. There's no opposition. Did we need to vote on that? I can't remember. <laughs> I didn't think so. Okay, so Job then- well done tonight, Madam Secretary. <laughs> well done, bravo. Beautifully, well beautifully. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so no opposition, we can go ahead and adjourn this meeting at 7.49 p.m. Thank okay. you all very much. Bye. Have a great Bye. night. Bye. Be safe, night. everyone. David, I don't need to do anything, right? Just close out the meeting? Or do I need to close it out on YouTube Live separately? Close it out on YouTube Live. Or actually, if you just end the meeting, you're good to go. Okay, yeah, all right, thank you. On YouTube Live. Awesome, thank you. No problem.